Hello, class. I apologize for getting this video to you a little bit later than normal. Unfortunately, last weekend my computer crashed and I lost all of the work, data, and research that I had amassed over the last calendar year. It's been a little frustrating to say the least, but I am beginning to catch up now on uh, getting you the academic content that is constitutive of this college course. Today we're going to continue talking about the Dialogue on Personal Identity and Immortality by John Perry. This and we're going to talk about the second night. Here's some study guide questions to help us get started. 1. What is Miller's wake-up argument against Wyrob? 2. What is Miller's metamorphosis argument against Wyrob? 3. What is Wyrob's response to Miller's arguments? 4. What is Miller's proposal for identifying persons over time? 5. What is Wyrob's response to Miller's proposal? 6. Which problem about a circle of definition arises for Miller's proposal once Wyrob responds? Okay, as always, you'll want to write down the answers to these questions as they appear in the video, or type them up, or crochet them into a sweater, or whatever. It'll help you uh, compartmentalize the information as we proceed through this section of the dialogue. So, when Miller and Cohen return to visit Wyrob as she is dying and having her final moments in her hospital bed, Miller takes up the offensive position. He claims that if Wyrob's view of the world is correct, then she's just a human body. And he has a couple of arguments to show that persons are not just human bodies. The first one is what we'll call the wake-up argument. Let's present it this way. One. If persons are just physical bodies, then in order to know who you are when you wake up in the morning, you have to check your body first. 2. But it's not the case that in order to know who you are in the morning when you wake up, you need to check your body first. You just kind of know. You, you know, your eyes may be closed, you don't, you, you can't see which body you've got, but you know who you are. 3. So, persons are not just physical bodies. That's his argument. He basically thinks that, look, if a person was just a mortal chunk of flesh, a physical chunk of biological matter, then in order to know which person you are, you need to know which biological chunk of matter you are. And in order to know which biological chunk of matter you are, you have to use your senses and check. But look here, you don't have to use your senses and check to see which body you've got in order to know who you are, the minute that you wake up, even when your eyes are still closed, as long as you're conscious, you can just intuit that you're this person and not that one. For instance, when I wake up in the morning, and before I open my eyes, I can say, I'm Jason Bowers. I don't know why I would say that, but I could! And so, that's meant as an argument against why Rob's position that people are just physical bodies and people go out of existence when their bodies go out of existence. Building on this argument, Miller also appeals to the short story Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. That's a very excellent story and full of literary and existential depth, by the way. I highly suggest that you read it and not just read it, but study it, read some papers about it. It's a really, really good story. In that story, the protagonist, Gregor Samsa, whose last name is intentionally similar to Kafka's and whose first name is taken from the masochistic character in the von Sacher Masoch piece, Venus and Furs, wakes up to discover that he has the body of a gigantic insect. Ungezwiefer? A vermin of something. Most people assume it's like a giant cockroach. He wakes up with the body of a giant cockroach, and yet, despite having that body, it's still Gregor Samsa. It's still that guy, that person. You can have the very same person with all their thoughts and dispositions and personality traits even in the body of a cockroach. It's perfectly conceivable. And if it's conceivable to have Gregor Samsa in the body of a cockroach, well, that should show there's nothing logically impossible about a person having a different body. In a way, Miller is kind of getting this from why Rob's use of the Blue River argument. So let's put the metamorphosis argument this way. One, if persons are just physical bodies, then it is impossible for someone to wake up with a different body than the one that they were born with. 
too, but it's not impossible for a person to wake up with a different body than the one they were born with. Consider Kafka's metamorphosis. 3. So, persons are not just physical bodies. What these arguments have in common is they both rest on the idea that you can clearly conceive of being the same person without having any certainty of which body you've got. And if you can clearly conceive of that, well, that should be a real possibility. There's no contradiction in the idea, so it can happen. But if it can happen, that means that people are not just physical bodies. Wyrob points out that this is essentially how the arguments go. And in response to the arguments, she says, look, these may be convincing arguments against a simple identification of persons with their bodies, but it's not an argument for mind-body dualism. It doesn't show that the idea of a soul is any more sensible. It doesn't show that Wyrob should start believing in immaterial entities that house her consciousness. So what is the argument supposed to do? Miller admits, that's right, I am not using these arguments to try to show that souls exist, and I don't have any hope of convincing you that souls exist either, but what it does allow me to do is propose something else. Miller's proposal is this, that to be the same person from one moment to the next, a person must be able to remember their previous experiences. Let's put it a little bit more formally. If a person X at time T is the same person as a person Y at time T2, where T2 is later than T, then Y at T2 can remember the experiences of X at T, and vice versa. If a person Y at T2, a time which is later than T, can remember the experiences of a person X at a time T, well then, X and Y are the same person. We're going to call this a memory-based criterion of personal identity, or a memory criterion of personhood. It says, if you've got a person at one time, and you've got a person at another time, what would make them the same person? Well, if there's a certain connection amongst their experiences and memories. That's what makes them the same person. If the person at the later time can remember having the experiences of the person at the earlier time, then they're the same person. Those are two different stages in the career of one single person across history. As a helpful analogy, Miller and Wyrob discuss the phenomenon of turning on a TV. These were things that you watched before you had computers. Seeing that there is a game on, turning it off, then turning it on again and seeing a game. One might ask, how do I know that these are the same game? What would make it the case that they are the same game? And they agree that, well, for those two little episodes to be in the same game, there must be some kind of connection between each of their events. One of them should be a continuation of the other in some sense. That's what it would be for them to be the same game. And likewise, if you've got a person at one time and a person at another, what it is for them to be the same person is for there to be a connection between them, for there to be a continuation between one experience and another. And so they explain the memory-based criterion of personal identity using the game as an analogy. Now, this idea is not new. Why Rob mentions that the philosopher John Locke actually thought about this, and it's true, in his essay concerning human understanding, John Locke defends a memory-based criterion of personal identity. In fact, he famously claimed that since a parrot in a court of law exclaimed that it could remember the experiences of another person, this is hard for me to believe, that parrot should be identified with the person whose experiences the parrot was reporting having. Is that a reductio or a theorem? Likewise, there are people who argue that if a person commits a crime and then they lose all of their memories, all of their historical connections to everyone they know, all of their recollections and familiarity with everything, and they have complete and total amnesia, well then they're not even the same person as the one who committed the crime, and you can't hold them accountable for the crime that that other person committed. 
these kinds of issues arise when you look at a memory-based criterion of personal identity. Now, in response to Miller's proposal, in response to the proposal that we use a memory-based criterion of personal identity to decide who is who over time, she points out that there's a very, very crucial difference between seeming to remember something and actually remembering it. She points out that under hypnosis, a person could be made to remember things that never actually happened. That is, they could seem to remember experiencing things even though those things never actually happened and they're not really remembering them. Suppose that a hypnotist gets a hold of me and convinces me that yesterday morning I set fire to my entire neighborhood. I wake up and I'm horrified. I did this horrible act of vandalism that destroyed all these people's lives. I burned a whole neighborhood. Oh my god. But that never actually happened. If there were any person who was doing that, that person, in fact, wasn't me. And the fact that I seem to remember having done those horrible things, that wouldn't establish that I was the same person. Likewise, a certain afflicted individual may be possessed with the conviction that they are Napoleon Bonaparte. That's just who they are. And they, they, they try to talk like Napoleon or, or dress like Napoleon. And when they wake up in the morning, they, with their eyes closed, will say to themselves with no dishonesty, I'm, I am Napoleon Bonaparte. I remember Waterloo. And so on. Now, if we were to take Miller's arguments at an uncritical face value, they would seem to suggest that the aforementioned person is Napoleon, and that I, in the aforementioned case, did set fire to the neighborhood. But that's not right at all. Miller's arguments don't work if we're talking about just seeming to remember something. They only work if there's a reliable connection between seeming to remember and actually remembering. And that's what why Rob presses Miller on next. What is the difference then between seeming to remember and actually remembering? After all, if why Rob dies and is then cremated, and then there appears somewhere a immaterial person with wings and a halo and a little harp that they're playing, if that person only seems to remember why Rob's life and doesn't actually remember it, well then, there is no survival of Wyrob. There is no afterlife of Wyrob. That person, that immaterial angelic person who seems to remember Wyrob's life, wouldn't be Wyrob. Any more than the aforementioned afflicted individual would really be Napoleon. They would just have the conviction that they were that person. It would just seem to them that they were that person, but they wouldn't really be them. So, she presses Miller. What is this difference then between seeming to remember and actually remembering? And here we get a problem. Miller agrees that in order to actually remember a previous experience, the person who had the previous experience must be you. And so we end up interdefining the notion of identity or being the very same person with the notion of actually remembering. X and Y at different times are the same person as long as someone can actually remember the experiences of the other. What is it to actually remember the experiences of the other? Well, you actually remember the experiences of the other if they are the same person. So we define same person in terms of actually remembering, and then we turn around and we define actually remembering in terms of being the same person. Why Rob wants to know, how is it possible for her to continue existing after the death of her body, given that her body is going to be destroyed? Miller says, there can be a person after your body is destroyed who is you. Why Rob asks, how can we establish that it's me? Miller answers, we can establish that it's you because it couldn't actually remember your life. Why Rob asks, how can we establish that it actually remembers my life? Miller says, well, it's because it's actually you. Circularity. We need something to break this circle. Fortunately, this is the point at which Cohen steps in and offers a solution. We'll talk about that next time. Thanks for watching.